welcome to Fan Future Society and uh, agreeing to be part of our series of conversations, Wendy, because really what this is designed to do, the whole intention, is just to get to know a broader range of people's work. You know, that article came out in Forbes, and then we thought, gosh, it'd be really fascinating to meet each one of these other people that were on the list and imagine that we're having a couple of coffee with them and just getting to know them. And rather than just doing it alone, we'll do it and record it and share it with others because um, I think we really do want more of these perspectives shared. We want more people interested and curious in the work that we've been doing as futurists and as women, but really just as futurists to be in those conversations. And uh, what we're seeing is that the breadth of the work is fantastic, and we all approach it very, very differently, but interesting at the core, have a very shared mission, and we're all coming at it with different backgrounds and perspectives, and um, it's fascinating to get to know other people's work. So the arc of this is a little bit about how you got to where you are, where your curiosities were, what you're working on right now, which is the part that we're really most excited about, and kind of where you think it's headed. Um, but you have been in this work for a long time, and I don't know anything about it, so I get to learn so much about you in this conversation. So to start, uh, Wendy, tell us how you define yourself. Uh, when people ask you, what do you do? What do you say? Oh, uh, when people ask what I do, well, I usually do tell them that I am a practicing futurist um, who teaches and facilitates and does research in emerging change and its impacts and uh, help people articulate what they want out of the future, as well as help them explore what the future may bring to them in the way of surprises and opportunities. So it, it, it kind of changes to suit the audience, actually, or, or to suit the context. True. Well, that's very true, too. But I, yes, I have a new neighbor who moved in recently. We were just walking through the neighborhood uh, together, and she asked me what I did. And I was like, you know, I always say strategic futurist, which is different than what you do. There's a different bent on it. Um, but I said, you know, strategic, and, and you see this sort of blank stare for a second. Um, and then we start chatting about it. And what you realize is, in some ways, she is not so much a practicing future, certainly not the way that you are, but she is helping people prepare for the future. She's a litigator inside in, uh, a corporation and she's been training, she's in her 30s and she's been training her colleagues about how to use digital tools to be able to do uh, virtual uh, trials and depositions and all that kind of stuff. And so she's trying to lead them into a more digital future. So we all have like our little piece of how we're helping prepare others exactly. for what lies ahead and how to do it differently. But you are so far ahead of this, right? 32 years ago, you founded, I'm trying to find my notes, I wrote them down somewhere. Um, you founded the uh, Institute for, uh, oh, sorry, the Infinite Futures Institute. No, right? it's not an institute. It's just Infinite Futures. It's me as a consultant. Oh, 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 oh I thought, okay, sorry. We, we framed it differently. So, um, but yeah. you again, it's the interesting if it were an ago. institute, but <laughs> yeah. Well, I, yeah. I'll give you full credit for that. Um, no, what I'm saying is like 32 years ago, you know, I was really curious about the world and I was a pretty good strategist at that point, but I hadn't really put this sort of futurist lens on it. So what led you to this work back then? It was actually before that. Um, as an undergraduate, I was in a kind of interesting program at Michigan State University that, uh, first of all, it was a residential arts college modeled after Oxford. So it meant, it meant to sort of say, Michigan State, huge university with, you know, literally one of the largest universities on the planet at that point in terms of the amount of people there and fantastic resources. But the trade-off was fantastic resources, but you were classes of like 300 unless you signed up for one of the residential programs, in which cases you had the top professors because they didn't want to teach 300 people in the class. They wanted to have small conversations. So you had this, this sort of great uh, sort of almost semi-tutorial small discussion group um, series of elective classes, but you could choose your major from any of the classes out in the university. So it was ideal. And there was a small group of us, and we were warned about this, and there were a small group of us that inevitably ended up doing this anyway, who kind of just treated it as an intellectual smorgasbord. <laughs> and then, of course, got to the end of our undergraduate degrees, and they went, so what is your major? And you kind of, and they used to, the faculty used to joke that so many people said, you know, man in the universe. And when they turned to me and said, so what was your, what is your major? What are you declaring as your major? I said, philosophy, technology, and social change, which to me sounded like a real thing. And they went, ah, oh, it's another man in the universe. And I thought, this is real. And then, of course, several you know, years after that, science, technology, uh, society, and values majors started cropping up all over the place. So, But what actually led me into that was when I started as an undergrad, I thought I wanted to go into television and radio production. And the first TV sort of studio course that I had was taught within this 
um, this residential college, one of the professors there was interested in media and, and video production. And so he taught a video lab and took it and did that. And that was interesting. But the important part was that one of the required books was McLuhan's Understanding Media. Ah. Which almost everybody else in the course went, what is this weird? What? And I went, this is awesome. And that really kicks off my interest in the notion of technology and its impacts on society and civilization and perception and how we uh, order the world. And so I, it, it rolled out from there and taking uh, a wide variety of courses on um, social change, innovation, uh, patterns of change throughout history. And by the time I was sort of, oh, and then I also extended it from a fourth year into a fifth year undergrad program because I was just having too much fun. But by the last few years, the books that I started spotting in the bookstores that I found most interesting, I turned them over and, you know, where books generally say, especially paperbacks will say history or biography or something to help people shelve them. They actually started saying future studies. And ah. I thought, what is that? It sounds like it, it sounds like it's right up my alley. So I started looking for graduate programs in future studies. And my choice ended up being, at the time, Minnesota, which, you know, I was coming from Michigan. I'd already been in Michigan during two of the worst blizzards in 100 years. And I thought, yeah, Minnesota hmm, or Hawaii. <laughs> So it's really interesting I, that Hawaii has become such a, a, a sort of whatever a stronghold for foresight studies. Well, Jim Dater went out of his way to build an extremely strong and innovative uh, master's and PhD program in future studies. Yeah. So, and that was, and I started in what seventy nine which was about a year after it had been founded as an actual graduate program, yeah. and kind of. Uh, did my graduate work there and extended that kind of uh, probably unreasonably, but again, I was having a good time. And more importantly, part of the reason I was extending it was because we were doing a lot of research projects at the Hawaii Research Center for Future Studies. And so it kind of rolled into um, a research, what they called a research faculty position where I was, I was basically doing futures research. I was just going to ask you um, what your first job out of school was. So and you just transitioned right into this education. Yeah. And at some point they went, but you have to finish your dissertation and submit it really at some point. So I finally did. Um, and in the meantime, this takes me from Hawaii to Oxford. Uh, my husband was majoring in Korean and Japanese history and he finished up his studies and his PhD and was offered a job at Oxford. So we relocated to England. And at that point, um, I shifted into doing more freelance research and consulting and facilitation and training. So that's Got actually what, what started it all off. Have you ever and worked then, for someone or have you always been on your own? Uh, that's a good question. Um, not in the sense of having worked for a large corporation, no. So um, I have also been teaching off and on at the University of Houston's master's program in future studies and foresight. Right. For but what I think is fascinating, because one of the key threads in this, which I think is actually really, really inspiring for young women who watch this series, is how self-directed these careers have all been. You know, each of us has sort of found this thing that we're really curious about, that we socially want to learn about, this thing that we want to share, and a way that we can share it, whether it's as educators or as speakers or as facilitators or as researchers or as strategists. But we've all found a way um, to be able to turn other people onto this thinking in a way that is non-traditional. And yet what I would have to add to that is um, self-directed but impossible without a rich network and community support. Because totally. In actual fact, what happened was I, well, we, we moved to England and um, then actually I was invited to be a visiting faculty member at the University of Houston. So I was basically in Houston for about five years and came back. And then I had a Fulbright at the Finland Futures Research Center, Center for half a year. And that was fascinating and came back and had to start, um, yeah, you know, building, self-directing and essentially what ended up happening was un I affiliated myself with a number of other colleagues, some of whom had 
full on, you know, research corporations, others of whom were also um, kind of uh, sole proprietors, self-employed freelancers. And essentially what, what would happen and, and the futures community in the UK at the time, we all pretty much knew each other. And so what would happen essentially is that a project would come up and you would go through the thought of, is this someone basically asking to do sort of a workshop or a series of workshops, have them facilitated? It's something I can handle myself. Or is this a full on year long uh, scenarios building project where I'm going to need a team and the workshops that we do will need a team of facilitators. And at that point, either I would subcontract a group of folks or, um, you know, like Sammy Consulting would say, okay, you, we're now calling you a fellow or a principal or whatever, and essentially we're subcontracting the people. So there was this great sense of networking that led to responding to different, um, different calls for proposal from, you know, really big calls from the European Commission to, and the EU to smaller uh, UK agencies to specific um, corporations where we treated our, our sort of our known community as a virtual team and totally. we just compose, right, compose the kind of right um, set of skills for the necessary. And, and that actually, is to me the, the thing, you know, years ago when I was writing my website, um, we had the same model. Uh, so we had this extraordinary, we call them pinkers, people you need to know. It's an incredible network. Not necessarily all futurists, but people who come from all these different domains that we could bring in for different projects. And the way I would describe it is the future is fluid and so are our teams, right? That we needed to be able to have that kind of plug and play depending on what it is that we needed and for how long we needed someone's particular expertise. And I do think that that is this capacity of the future that folks are just, you know, uh, more folks in the world of business are starting to understand and trying to figure out how they build structures inside the organizations that allow for that kind of moving across the membrane um, of being full-time or part-time or contractor or not. There's labels that we keep putting on things. Um, but we've been working very comfortably in that for a long time. And I do think that that, I mean, you're absolutely right to make that more visible. Is that the, For me, at least, actively cultivating that network has been a big part of my work. Like I invest time in those relationships and in those affiliations and, and getting to know these people. I actually, when I was researching for our conversation today, I ran into a blog post that Jake Dunnigan had written uh, in the Institute for the Future and he referenced you in it. And I thought, oh, duh, like Jake, I love Jake. We always try to figure out how to hang out, you know, another futurist uh, here in, in Austin. Uh, so it's just, I, I do think that's a really important part that I think my business colleagues, my corporate business colleagues do not invest enough time in and have not really found uh, as useful as they will in the years to come. And, and part of that, and this is a, there's a tension here, and, and particularly for those of us that have spent a lot of time in academic future studies, are kind of more aware of that tension or feel it more. Um, one of the things that makes that work is when people are generous with the output. Right. And so the the idea that um, as soon as you do something, you share it and you put it out there as creative commons. And obviously there are times you can't do that. You're, you, you're working with a company that says, no, this is proprietary. And you know, okay, we can respect that. But the ability to, um, to freely share not only tools and methods and data resources, but wow, this really worked if well, that just crashed and burned. Don't duplicate that. Right. And, and the outcomes that you get, I think, is also really important because it's how we continue to be a learning community and a teaching community, even you know, no, even when it's not in formal academic settings. But that tension between the academic um, need or goal of creating knowledge or insight and sharing it as widely as possible and as publicly as possible with what is sometimes the the real need. Um, in private, uh, private, and even sometimes in public sector work of um, letting the company own well, the, the proprietorist, right? No, but, totally. Yeah, you know, and I learned my lesson on that one. Uh, and because again, I have not done any of the academic studies work that you have done. Like, I wish I had known that future studies existed when I was in college in the early '80s. You know, uh, I even wish behavioral economics had existed. Okay, <laughs> it did. I just didn't know it was there. I went to a tiny little women's, you know, liberal arts college, and 
it was doctor, lawyer, engineer, teacher, mom, you know, that was sort of banker. If those are my options. Um, so I'm excited that you learned about this so early and we're such a, a forerunner in the thinking around this. But, you know, as I have stumbled my way into it, um, I did a project years ago with a big um, set of clients, two clients together, and didn't hold on to any of the IP. And, you know, everything that came out of it, they wanted to lock down and make proprietarily theirs. And there was such great insight that we had cultivated together, uh, mm -hmm. the three teams, and that it would have been so valuable if we had published that in some form or another to help other people better prepare for what it is that we were having. It was just locked down, and I was so frustrated. So we did another project uh, last year, and a friend of mine reminded me, um, and we ensured that we shared the IP and we were able to share it after the work was done because otherwise it's just – yeah, to your point, there's a lot of brain power and a lot of curiosity that gets um, created and, and really valuable work. Yeah, and the other tension, I think, between the academic and the um, and contracted futures work. Yeah. And this is something that various of us have been kind of inveighing against about for a long time, is academic work assumes that you, you're, you are in experimental mode, right? That you're, you're thinking in terms of, we're about to make an intervention in an organization or community or a culture here by asking them to think differently and become more aware of changes in their external context and considering how that will shift the system and create emergent properties and all of that. Um, so academically, you'd think, so we need to go back a year later and evaluate what the impacts were of the intervention we made. And there is very, it, it's very difficult to have the opportunity or to build into a research project, a contracted research project, the opportunity to do that. I know. That is very, very true. That and, is true. And it's one of the things that in many ways is even holding us back from being more successful commercially because I can't tell you the number of times that I've had um, the more skeptical people among a client community right. say, well – what good is this going to do us? Yeah, what was the result? Give me an, ex like, what give me happened? an example of, you know, of some, some organization who's, you know, rocked the world after you've had one of these workshops or that you've done. Right, exactly. These, uh, future studies. So that is still a, a week. That's true. And where I thought you were going to go with that, actually, because that is very, very true. Um, but there's another piece where I was preparing for you to go, which was that also when you do this work, right, we don't know exactly how it's going to go down. I mean, I don't know, again, your, your um, process might be more, defined and more clear, but I go in and once someone once, once, um, lovingly said to me that I've got an ambiguous project process that leads to an ambiguous deliverable and that that makes it really challenging for the people to come on the lot ride with me. Um, but the outcome is great. Like I can point to the work at the end and say, we got to some really, really great thinking and we came at it very differently than most people have come at it. Um, but to explain someone in the middle of the process that it's going to be more emergent and we're going to learn this and then pivot here and then, then try and work with procurement people inside big organizations to explain that this process is a learning process and a discovery process um, is very challenging for folks. I think it's getting better. We're having more of those conversations now um, more comfortably than we did in the past, but this is really an unusually great time to be doing futures work. I know, right? Because people don't argue with you about uncertainty and shocks anymore. <laughs> they kind of go, well, we're living it. So uh, we are experiencing this, and we now relate to what you're saying. So I know, which is also, I think, and also, I, I hopefully, I don't know about you, but they see, for me, at least a confidence in it. Like, I'm not completely freaked out by it. I don't feel, over, like, I, I, like I, I don't just look at the future and think we're all going to get, you know, pummeled by it and that we've got no place to move or to grow or to think. And so I do think that there's a, um, something that they find encouraging about um, our outlook on it that they find hope in. Is that what you're feeling? Yes, somewhat. Although one of, one of the difficulties that I'm having at the moment is um, we've kind of 20 or 30 years ago, a lot of uh, what we would talk about in terms of onrushing change and the big systemic change, there was still time to address. Mm. We are coming out of one of the greatest shocks to the world sort of social, economic, political systems um, that most of us have lived through in our lifetimes. Sure. And instead of coming out of it with uh, plenty of runway space, to make change, we're coming out of it and essentially about to go into a wall of system limits at a zillion miles an hour with 
no one showing any signs of putting on any brakes. And there are things that do make me optimistic, but that optimism is being challenged more and more by, as the time interval that we have to act before we really are in a catastrophic situation becomes vanishingly small. So um, I'm a lot less optimistic than I was 20 years ago. About so what are the, the catastrophic like? situations that most frighten you that we think that we're not prepared for or not responding to adequately enough? Like if you put your list together, what's at the top? The climate crisis and the environmental crisis. Okay. But that's being driven by um, an inability for most of the people that are on top of the systems that currently exist and like being on top to acknowledge that those systems are what are driving those two crises and that we fundamentally have to do things differently. And we, and, and now we have no time to make that be a gradual transition. It has to be fundamental shifts accomplished very quickly. So people talk about, you know, I, I did a set of scenarios along with my colleagues at Sami Consulting um, for the EU and what they had asked for. And we finished this up um, just in the autumn 2020. So uh, what they had asked for, they were interested in research and innovation, and they wanted to explore what how to stress test the European Union's strategies or the European Commission's strategies for research and innovation partnerships throughout the world. And so they wanted to imagine how kind of global context for research and innovation might shift. And then within that, how the 10 different regions that they define geographically that were not to the EU, what within those four global scenarios they would look like to 2040 and what that would mean for the context for research and innovation. And so what that implies for policies of of connecting with them. And they were pretty, uh, one of the scenarios in particular was pretty dark, but they were all fairly challenging with regard to collaboration versus sort of fragmentation, uh, maintaining business as usual versus demand for change. Um, but what was interesting was we actually started writing them, the actual scenarios, in February of 2020. Ah. So we were writing these global scenarios and, and, and the pandemic kicked in and literally every day we would get up and there would be some uh, news report that basically made us go, wow, so we're going to have to rewrite that section. Oh, well, <laughs> that, oh, that, that scenario. Okay. This is, it, it was a constantly moving target because of the turbulence in the global systems that the pandemic was generating and so it was a very it was very interesting exercise but one of the things that it demonstrated we we got to the end and we finally said okay pens down we have to yes the world is in chaos but we have to say that this is you know these are our scenarios and i was sharing them with a friend and he looked at them and went even for the darkest one he said there's there's not enough death in this there's not seriously Mm -hmm. you're, you're not and and it even for those of us that are used to looking ahead and considering both best possible outcomes, most weirdest possible outcomes Mm -hmm. and worst possible outcomes, it's hard to really acknowledge that things could go badly awry and touch our own personal lives. And I think that's, what's interesting about the pandemic is that it's brought home to people that change is not always something that happens to other people. Right. Sometimes it happens to you. And it's it's interesting because I'm I'm having I'm having to have that conversation in a number of places these days, um, with some folks that uh, I'm working on with health systems and, and it's like health everything is going to be challenged. Everything health related and well being related in communities is going to be challenged by our our business as usual hitting the system limits that we're running into. So it, it's an interesting time to be a futurist. <laughs> it is. Well, so gosh, there's like five questions I want to ask you once. So I'm going to start with this okay. and then I hope I remember the second one, which is, okay. were you surprised by the pandemic? Um, 
not in the sense of thinking that it was a black swan. We had been, quite frankly, most of the futures community has been having, and there will be a pandemic, you know, on our lists of emerging potential changes because of globalization and the speed at which we're moving things around and the extent to which uh, human systems are encroaching on natural systems in ways that make it easier for viruses and bacteria and everything else to move around and mutate. So in that sense, no. Um, and in the sense of watching the reports out of Wuhan and thinking, hmm, we went into, basically my husband and I just looked at each other and went, yes, we're going to start self-isolating now. We don't care what the UK government is doing. And that was kind of early in March of 2020. So it, it was, it wasn't surprising. How it played out was, I guess, breathtaking in the sense that it was, What was surprising is is it was not something, again, bringing it home, it was not something I had imagined living through. Mm -hmm. And so I found myself thinking about all of the things, for example, that my parents lived through that I'm sure they kind of went, how did we get here? You know, World War II, right. how did that happen? My father, right. how am I in Australia being an artillery sergeant? Or my mother saying... I married, I thought I was going to be a housewife. How am I running an insurance business? Because all the men are, you know, in theaters of war. So, so the kind of, when, when changes become this abruptly systemic in ways that filter down into everyday life very rapidly, it's like there's this sheer force between a change coming in and different systems kind of stopping or being halted or being transformed at different rates right in front of your eyes. That part is a surprising personal experience, I guess. Has that, that affected sense. your thinking about your work or your teaching around this? Because... Um, only that it's given me more of a gut level feel of of what the mental state would be like when I say to people, when we're doing, say, impact cascades and futures wheels, when I say, here's a change, imagine its immediate primary impacts and make sure you think about them not in institutional terms or it will change the U.S. educational system, but what will it mean for Monday morning? When you're sending your kid off to school, will you still be sending your kid off to school? Right. Or will she instead be just wandering around the neighborhood with her, you know, iPad talking to her about uh, the system of trash pickup and the life cycles of butterflies and, you know, there won't actually be a, a physical right. school to go off to. I mean, so what does it mean? at the gut level to experience some kinds of these, these kinds of changes, some of these changes that we're seeing. So it, it, it makes that, I think, even more urgent to have to, to um, help people have that exploratory feeling. And one of the great things about it, to go back to sort of future studies generally, um, one of the great things about the evolution of futures thinking and foresight in the past 10 years has been that movement into understanding, quite frankly, the neuroscience of imagination and mm -hmm. the interplay between senses and vividness and imagination. And so the work that we're seeing in experiential futures and design futures and, and all of that has been very exciting to, to watch that emerge in the field. Yeah, can you tell us more about it? When people talk about experiment, ex <coughs> sorry, experiential futures, what, how do you define that? Um, I define it as uh, moving from a, an abstract expression of here are primary drivers of change. If you extrapolate them out, they may have these ranges of impacts. Here's a story or a description verbally of what that world would be like. So moving from that, which is valuable. Right, right, right. And in actually fact, feeling, right. yeah, to, to actually saying we need to have you walk into that world. So we're going to build artifacts or we're going to build a room that has a story that you can walk into and get a sense for what, what the ambiance of that context would be, of that future context would be like and how different it would be from the present. And I think it really brings it home to people, again, at that, at that gut emotional and uh, gestalt level of, oh, it's, it's not just that 
we're going to have two-way wrist radios. It's that that's going to change so many other aspects of daily life for good and for ill. So literally back when I was a child reading Sunday comments, comics and Dick Tracy had a two-way wrist radio and we all thought, well, that's cool. Um, and it was, it was, it had a video on it. So essentially, you know, um, Apple's smartwatch. Um, and, but now we have it and what we're finding is, yeah, people may use their, their Apple watches to make phone calls and talk to each other, but what are they actually using it for? They're actually using it for GPS positioning and, and tracking, you know, their run and they're using it to completely track their health systems. And they're kind of worried about the fact that all that data is going somewhere. And so someone is surveilling them. And does that mean their insurance is going to cost more or cost less? So it's that range of spinning out really the, 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 knock-on implications and the impact cascades that come from something where you think, well, that's an exciting little innovation, or that's an exciting new um, habit that, you know, uh, or, or a new, um, new fun thing, new leisure activity that, that teenagers are doing. That's, that's fun to watch, but wow, it also has all these other... Well, that's so one that's of the things I think that I, I think is the hardest to predict is exactly how people are going to respond and what the other contextual pieces are. That's one of the examples that I talk about is if I had told people 15 years ago that there would be this thing, a $25 billion, I don't know what it's worth today, a uh, company based on the selfie, right? First you would have gone like, well, what is a selfie? Uh, and then you would <laughs> have understood that it actually became a communications platform, right? So when you hear Evan Spiegel talk about Snapchat and what he was able to envision, or I think about Wikipedia, we're like, oh, okay, great. We can take this. And we can take the Encyclopedia Britannica and we can put it online. And we'll call it Encarta and we'll put the same kind of business model around it. And didn't realize that what it actually allowed for was a swarm effect, this hive effect, if you will, of being able to go build an information resource that could be updated every minute in some sort of way that we basically trust. You know, it doesn't, I wouldn't put my thesis. Well, I just right. researched on it, but you can certainly find out, you know, who was queen at what particular year. <laughs> Well, and to some extent, we trust the fact that they have devised a synthetic culture exactly. of rules of relationship and rules of fact building that exactly. allow a crowd of people to create an amazing resource and double check each other in a variety of ways. Right, and not and necessarily distort it uh, in a very, uh, whatever, greedy or selfish or self-interested way. Like there's a way of protecting for the most part around that. I got to tell you, I did, the reason I said it about the queen is when I was watching the crown. So here, you'll laugh at this as a, as a foresight professional, futurist studies professional. I was watching black mirror for a while and I'm like, Oh my God, this is just so bleak. And because I know that this is actually really much closer than most people realize that this really is. There are a couple episodes that I just, I couldn't digest anymore. So I went to go watch the crown, but well, at least we know how that all turned out. Right. So I'm watching the crown and the whole time I'm watching it, I'm like literally Googling and Wikipediaing all the various things about was Churchill really a painter? Was someone so really doing such and such? Like it was fascinating to have that as my guide, as my sort of like, you know, uh, way of being able to annotate my TV experience. And for the most part, yeah, I, I trusted that as a resource and it was just so great. You know, my children have a really hard time imagining what life was like before Google. And <laughs> you could just look stuff up and you had to kind of bumble your way without that kind of intelligence right there at your fingertips. So those are the kinds of things I think to your point, we may have predicted that there were these technological innovations, but we would not have necessarily understood how they changed the way that we all process life. Exactly. Exactly. And, and how ex essentially an awful lot of our, our information technology extends our brains. Right. Right. And our memory. And so that aspect of it and, and its implications in odd little app things about everyday life. So, for example, you know, being a movie buff. And in the old days, I go, I know that actor. Where have I seen that actor before? Well, I don't even do that anymore. I go, oh, I know that actor. I look it up on the Internet Movie Database. And, yes, right. this is all his entire back catalog, right? So the kinds of information we have access to is amazing. And the downside of that of course, is the kinds of misinformation we have access to is appalling. Um, and I think that, you know, the great plague of the 21st century is, is the mental plague of um, misinformation and, and people's distrust of the concept of facts. Well, that's what I'm going to ask you. So when I asked you that list, and I wasn't trying to be cheeky when you talked about climate and ecological you know, destruction and devastation, those are huge, but we also have 
the world of deep fake and the lack of trust or synthetic media, how do you want to describe that? This idea that we keep thinking we can turn to some trusted resource and that trusted resource will be able to be completely manufactured, you know, can be now and will continue to be uh, in the very near future. Like that scares me a great deal, right? The rise of political systems that I think, you know, are very scary is very real for me. The fact that we can take AI and it can be so biased is very real for me. So there are some very big things that I think as humans we are not quite prepared for. Um, that I think, I guess what I look at history then, and I'm interested to get your point of view, Wendy, and, and realize that those things have happened throughout time and somehow we developed the literacy that allowed us to navigate through that, right? Um, I was very comforted to know that Hamilton and Jefferson would print out all kinds of pamphlets, you know, anonymously to call each other out back in the day, and somehow <laughs> we figured out our way through that land of misinformation, right? So do you have hope as humans that we just have to get through this moment and we get better at being able to build systems that keep us safe? Well, what generally makes me optimistic on all on, on the score of all of these, and, and I, I should just uh, insert another little thing that I have worked on in the last five years that I'm relatively proud of, uh, Policy Horizons Canada, which is one of the best of the government-based futures research groups, um, was asked by the uh, Social Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada to identify like the next 10 years worth of global challenges that they could use as priorities for when researchers in Canada were applying for grant money, essentially. Ah, ah. So interesting question. Um, and they went, yeah, we already get that climate change is a bad thing, but, but so we do, we, that was like on our last list. So don't overlook it, but really what else? <laughs> I love that we're going to move on. We haven't solved yeah, that like, problem, but we're just going to like say we've already done it. Yeah, right? It's like, we're taking it for granted now. We're all doomed. Okay. Let's get over that. And just, you know, what really, but, um, and it, it did actually, um, living, you know, living on a habitable planet became one of them. But essentially, uh, we, I, I worked with them um, and we put together uh, basically a, um, based on scanning of the emerging changes and emerging challenges and everything else, we put together a really interesting collection of kind of grand global challenges. Um, the, or I think what's the report actually called, the emerging global challenges, something like that. Um, but misinformation was one of them. For sure. Uh, the issues of um, the ongoing tensions about defining uh, identity, sex, gender, uh, mm -hmm. and how that ties in with the rights of different genders and sexes was one of them. Uh, obviously, the climate crisis and the environmental impact was another. Um, interestingly, we, you know, in a bid to to give the artists and humanities folks something to look at, we pointed out that one of the other uh, issues is the erosion of some of the great um, landmarks of, of human civilization. The fact that you know, if you have um, if you have things like Stonehenge in the UK or Jaisalmer in India, and you have a massive tourist industry that commodifies them, and you have so many people going to visit them, you're, you basically, literally erode them out of existence. Right. And what have we lost at a deeper, you know, the, the kind of cultural extinction issues. Um, and that also ties in with the fact that there are languages that are going extinct and, and that really is a cultural loss. So it's, it's an interesting group of challenges that gets beyond just the, well, yes, we're having this problem of the fact that we're totally running out of runway space again on the environmental resources. So, so um, again, I, we could spend like three hours having this conversation. And, and Emma oh. and I always talk about the fact that I want to really create a retreat. I want everyone to come and gather for a few <laughs> That's days a good idea. and have these amazing like conversations over wine and sunsets and walks. Uh, that to me would be like my nirvana. Um, so hopefully at some point we will pull that off. But between now and then in the few moments that I got left, I have multiple questions I want to even, we need to talk about your healthcare work because I think that's a really, really fascinating thing. Or we can talk for a second about where do you think this work has actually had an impact? Like, do we think that we are paying attention to some things now? And that there is at least, I definitely, you talked about it's a good time to be a futurist. I think mean, people are definitely much more open and hungry for some of this information and want to feel like they're better prepared uh, than they have been in the past. So where do we think that we're actually really starting to catch some attention? Do you think it's at the academic level, the enterprise level the populist level like where, where, where do you see this i think a lot of it. I, it it's interesting because there was a point in time um and i'm trying to remember exactly when it was but like mid 90s 
when those of us who were kind of in the academic futures community were looking around and going, we are the last generation. <laughs> no one is interested in futures. We're doomed, you know. Um, and what we've seen in the last 20 years has been this amazing, burgeoning, blossoming of interest in futures work in both academia and um, and in the public sector and in the private sector and in philanthropy. And so if you look around, in particular, the last 10 years, there have been stunning projects done in every sector across all the different approaches that you can imagine to futures thinking and strategic foresight and uh, future studies. And you have the global program that the UN is sponsoring on futures literacy. And you have the work that uh, a group of primarily women in the younger generation of futurists is supporting on um, decolonizing futures and futures diversity in futures. Um, you have some of the work that uh, some colleagues of mine um, with whom I'm happily uh, involved in this are doing on the concept of post-normal times and kind of chaos and turbulence um, and, and what that means for how we do futures thinking. Um, so, so if anything makes me optimistic is that in fact, yes, I'm, I'm seeing this almost as a flowering golden age of uh, futures thinking in terms of people bringing all kinds of new perspectives and new um, frameworks for thinking and new tools from different disciplines which is actually very true to the roots of future studies because it was uh, formed by scholars who came from all sorts of different disciplines and they dragged along the theoretical frameworks and the conceptual frameworks and the tools from all their disciplines. So we're seeing that again and it's uh, again it's moving into this space of more seamlessly connecting greater diversity, more uh, broader timelines from you know very deep history to very deep futures. Um, more of the arts and humanities, more of the design work, more speculative fiction. It, it is actually a fantastic age to be right. involved in futures activities. It's very exciting. And, and so I'm optimistic from the futures point of view. I'm also, quite frankly, optimistic from the non-futures point of view. And I, I was about to say this, and then we had that moment of being excited about grand challenges. Um, but the when I am depressed at the amount of things that are going awry, one of the things that kind of keeps the light on are the number of ordinary people and local organizations and movements all around the world that are addressing all of these global challenges. Okay. Granted, they don't frequently have the power and the clout and the resources of some of the people that are still up at the top. I was going to say yet. The, yet. The, yeah, yet of the levers of power of the old system, right. but more and more and more people are kind of pouring into those spaces of critique, rebellion, creativity, innovation um, in their local communities, all the way up to global collaborations. So that gives me hope. That makes me optimistic. Um, Good. A so then, them, um, them are women. Pardon me, what'd you say? And a lot of them are women. I know. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, and that's exactly what we want. Is we want more diverse everyone, right? We want young. We want diversity of all kinds of gender and all kinds of background, all kinds of curiosity. Which we talked about the multidisciplinary or the multi perspective. So one thing that I have always um, been curious about because I, I run a couple of sessions or workshops or discussions or panels around science fiction and the impact that it has on our narratives of the future, both personally and collectively. And so as I was reaching, researching for one of those, I saw a piece that talked about utopian science fiction has a much more uh, impactful point of view or, or, or drive for us than dystopian, right? That, that fact that we always get scared by things don't actually move us to go fix that. But when we are inspired by what could be, we get very motivated to try and go create that. So have you seen in your work, do you find that one way of storytelling or narrative creation has more impact than the other? If you tell the more hopeful story versus the more less hopeful one? That's really interesting. And again, it gets us, it, it begs the question of evaluating your work, which one doesn't, hasn't done often enough. Um, but it, I, I, I think where you get the most action is when you um, generate creative tension between those two poles. 
So when I'm actually doing, for example, straight on visioning workshops, I actually start off by saying, let's list all the fears. Okay, and now let's reverse them into their polar opposites. So you go from having a, a, a very, uh, and it's a very cathartic and is meant to be a very cathartic sort of, yes, this is everything we're worried about. We're going to be explicit. We're going to get it out there. We're going to acknowledge it. We're going to own it. Uh, we're, these are our fears. And you flip it over, and, and the, the flip side of the fears, when stated, again, in very detailed and specific terms, ends up being a list of very idealistic transformative goals. And the tension is uh, that that helps us act. I think is um, between you know the acknowledging what's going wrong and understanding that there are that that there are better ways to model the world, to model our relationships with each other, to model our relationships with nature. And the trick is then finding where there are, as Danella Meadows would say, leverage points in all the systems. And and that gets back to the okay. Let's look at let's look at emerging changes, which is the one part of data that we actually can collect as futures researchers, since we can't go and observe the futures. Um, so look at look at the data on change, on trends, on emerging changes, on really novel, surprising changes, and again extrapolate our, which changes will would tend maybe to nudge the system towards our fears, which changes would tend to nudge us into something that may not be exactly towards our most ideal uh, outcomes, but at least nudges us away from the fears. And one of the interesting things for me about um, in the issue of you know getting people to actually act on the futures thinking we ask them to do is, is the difficult conversations I have with my friends who are truly experts in complex adaptive systems and chaos. And the the fact that in very chaotic situations, cause and effect are decoupled. And in complex adaptive systems, they may be coupled, but they're loosely coupled and it's hard to really understand necessarily what outcome you're going to get. And so the fact that we're, we constantly have to um, tune and retune our awareness of change to get a sense of where the system is going, how it's adapting, and what the resultant emergent properties are that would create some future very different from today, so that we can constantly be kind of nudging, because we can't, you can't be directive with complex adaptive systems. It doesn't work. You can't sort of go, oh, well, here's where we are, there's where we want to be, there's the gap, we're going to do X, it's going to take us there, because that's not what happens in the real world. Right. So, and that's the part that's frequently, again, difficult to get across to people who are used to executive mindsets right. and command and control mindsets. Right. Is that, and it speaks back to what you were saying about an ambiguous, uncertain process that's heading in you know, emergent directions. And that is I, probably the hardest part to explain to people. And, I and also, I think, yeah. good, answers, good answers to the question of how do you know which scenario is correct? <laughs> Uh, Prepare for all of them. Okay, well, so the last thing, I, again, I could have this conversation for many, I could get out on this forever, and I wish I could study with you. I'm sure I would learn so, so very much. But um, I enjoyed your uh, Twitter feed recently, and there was a word that you posted that you were excited that you had discovered and was surprised that you didn't know existed. Do you remember the word? Irenic. Yeah. So tell us what Irenic and why we should all know that word. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to have to read uh, Irenic. Uh, uh, is it... Uh, uh, oriented to or aiming toward peace for peace. Is that the right definition? I think so. Um, one of the, uh, and it gets back to, it gets back to collaboration and the part of collaboration and the part of extended networks that we, we kind of kept alluding to and, and sidetracking around in terms of, you, you use your extended networks and they help you and you help them. You, you share things among your extended network and we all learn. There is a sense of uh, the need for, for sort of peaceful collaboration that allows us to be generous. And there is a generosity that supports greater peace and collaboration. And the, 
there was a, a great article and, and I'll have to send you the link because of course um, it's, it's in the evening here now and I'm not going to remember the exact name of the article, but it was in my Twitter feed, a great article on, um, on the notion of generosity of, of forming that as the goal of relationships. And it's, it's, mm-hmm. or to be, to go, go back to old anthropology, it's like the potlatch approach right. to relationships in your community, to working with your colleagues, to working with your, your clients, uh, your students, everyone else is, is the more generous you are, the more to them, the more generous they will be to you and the better off we will all be more peace, more learning. Wow, this is sounding very Pollyanna, but I think I think we need to talk about a an economy of generosity in the future. So. I love it. No, I'm I'm 100 with you, and this is basically that takes us full circle to the whole reason that the series exists. It is literally just to be able to share each other's thinking, to be able to make ourselves, you know, our, our collective work more visible, but also to shine a spotlight on each of you um, and all that you are bringing to this world and helping you know increase. Let hopefully, me, for me, my mission is to create a safe and thriving future for everyone, and the more of us that are in it, the better. So. Uh, and I have I have one idea that that I'll add to your safe and thriving future. Please, and it is one of those things that I've been that, that occurred to me a while back, and then I I actually built it into one of the the health scenarios that we are that we're just finishing up. Um, and I know Andrew Yang has been convincing everyone in America that universal basic income would be an awesome thing. Right. So my colleagues um, who who have seen me travel to lots of workshops and conferences know that one of the first things I do after a long haul flight, if I can, is I find some nearby spa that will iron out to be a massage all the, you know, weird like acid uh, deposits that you get from sitting crammed in a, an airplane seat for too long. And what I have decided the world really needs to make everybody's lives better, to make us feel more generous to each other in the world to uh, reduce the sense of touch starvation that is undoubtedly creating a lot of the tension and hostilities all around the world is universal basic income would be great. Universal daily massages would be even better. (laughs) (laughs) I'm with you. I'm with you. But again, that's an interesting thing. Better place. I, I, and hugs, right? Hugs and massages. I do think that that would be really good. What's really weird is to see, like, again, you and I grew up before massages became so, you know, mainstream and able to get a massage envy down the street. You know, we watched this culture grow. We weirdly watched cuddle therapy grow. Um, but I do think you're really onto something about the fact that we do, we, you know, we need each other more than just this way, right? And I, and I think that that's part of probably what this past year has been the hardest is that we have not been with each other and around each other and having this glass of wine or cup of tea or walk with one another um, and being able to hug each other. So with that, I give you a virtual one and say thank you so much for being part of this conversation and sharing your work so generously and your ideas so generously. And I'm excited thank to point so people much more and more to your thinking. I have to say, what I Googled you is a little hard, so if there's some good links that you want us to make sure that we put in the profile, please let us know. I am, yes, possibly one of the least, um, you know, the most under uh, the radar in terms of writing and various other things. That is going to change this year, so I will keep Okay, okay good. But, uh, I, I want you to be generous with your thinking, too, because it's, it's very important to the work that the rest of us are doing and the places where we get to go share it. So thank you for doing that. But let's, and let's also keep in mind the concept of um, thinking forward into the future uh, to a fem futurist event where we do all sit around and have wide range. Can we do that? Does that sound like fun to you too? That sounds fantastic. Yay. Okay, cool. 2022 at the very least, we will plan something for that. So wonderful. Thanks so much, Wendy. We really, really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Uh, good luck there. Thank and take you. good care of you. And you yourself. Bye bye.